Hello and welcome to another episode of Digital Signage Explored. Today we're speaking to Jim Nister about being able to create immersive digital signage experiences whilst keeping within a budget. Some really fascinating conversation topics here. So if you're looking at how to create something that's a lot more engaging than just an image on a screen, this episode is definitely going to be for you. Hello and welcome to Digital Signage Explored. My name is Tim and today we are joined by Jim Nister from Nister Digital Content. Thank you very much, Jim, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board. And the subject that we're going to talk about today is really exciting because I think it's a very good lead in from some of the other episodes we've had recently because we're talking about low budget immersion, uh, which is a subject I know excruciatingly little about. So with your expertise, hopefully we'll be able to pull out some, some nuggets of information to help people understand what that is. Um, before we do that, could you give a brief introduction to your experience and digital signing and where you kind of come from in the background? Yeah, for sure. Um, years ago, about 10 plus years ago, I had a little marketing agency and uh, we started getting a lot more into interactive work and experiential work and digital signage work and uh, focused all of our attention on to that. And that was agency was called Insteo. We were uh, acquired by Almo in 2018. And then uh, for the last couple of years, I've just been independent working as a creative director and now starting a new entity. <laughs> okay, perfect. And, and that's obviously yeah. led you to have some more interaction engagements with end customers, or are you typically speaking to resellers? What's the general conversation that you're having? Yeah, for over the years, it's been very consistent that I work with AV integrators and advertising agencies, but there are times that an end client will contact me directly. In the end, the end client is driving the creativity side of this. We're attempting to hit their vision. So that's always the common denominator for us. Hmm. Okay. And so low budget immersion, and we've got some video footage that I'll kind of splice in here as we're talking about this. Uh, Chip was kind enough to give us some demo content just to kind of demonstrate what this does. But could you, in a elevator pitch style, explain what that means? What low budget immersion is versus a different type? Yeah, I've done immersive content for years and years, and these projects are big. They have a lot of layers to them. And... Most importantly, they require pretty heavy duty PCs with GPUs and, and a lot of other things to get, actually get them to run. And immersive, just taking one step back is generally that you as the viewer are making the content in some way change. At least that's my understanding of it. That's the way I mm. like to define it. And so, you know, we have cameras, we have sensors, we have very complex systems to create this experience that when you walk up, up to this LED screen or regular screen or whatever else, things are changing based on what you're doing. You move around and the screen changes or lift and learn or any of the other things that we've seen over the years that are immersive or are, are triggered by you, not just a touch screen, but your body movement or whatever else. And yeah. now the idea is that maybe we don't need these unique software systems and these unique um, GPU heavy duty computers, we can work together, sort of tone things down a little bit, take a little bit of the processing off the top. So it's not as intensive uh, on requiring heavy duty GPUs, but then we can mm. also use regular cameras and not have to invest in all of these things. And so I've gone from doing multiple depth sensing, very custom cameras, uh, multiple PCs with multiple GPUs to doing something that's a subset of that, maybe not as mu as rich as that experience, but almost there with a regular webcam and a bright side. Mm, fascinating. And I like the positioning of this, especially because we, you know, we've had several different conversations around this so far, but where we're talking from corporate spaces and things, immersion is not a subject that often comes up, but funnily enough, it is a conversation that people seem to be having more and more of is about adding value to consumer experiences or customer experiences or even staff experiences where immersion to me is not necessarily always something where you go, oh, I lifted a switch and X, Y, Z happened. From the content that I see that you've made, it's there's some level of artistry about it. There's some level of beauty, of impact, of kind of this is adding value because it's creating an experience that is leaving an impact with me from either a brand perspective or just an environment perspective. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. So one of the areas that I've been focusing on is generative art. 
And mm. I, I'll share some other ideas about that later, but that's where a lot of the style is coming from in the work that I'm doing is because I had spent a better part of a year just focusing on building some generative art projects. Mm. And um, now I'm taking those generative art projects and putting a camera on them. Mm. So the art is being generated based on clues that it gets from that camera uh, in the scene. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, we've all seen the waterfall and <laughs> you can, you can show oh, a waterfall I'll now, some of that in here. Uh, yeah. you know, but uh, there's uh, that idea that as you walk up to a, an LED screen, you are making the water change or you move your arms around and everything else. And, and you know, those are nice and I get a lot of requests for those, but there's also a lot of requests for, Hey, I saw this, this half a million dollar vi visual digital art installation and we somewhat reference and be inspired by this other artist who created that. And that's often uh, somewhat of the creative brief that's given to me is, mm -hmm. hey, we want this to, to be compelling. We want to create a little bit of a story around this. We want it to look very visually rich. Mm. And yet wow. it needs to run on a low cost digital signage media player. <laughs> yeah. So, and so, so those are sometimes the trade-offs that I'm having to make. That's, that's fascinating because I think that is almost inching towards that level of scale that I've had a few different conversations about so far, which is you go, okay, you start off with someone that has created this immersive thing that costs, you know, 2.5 billion, uh, 2.5 million to make. Yeah. And they've got the highest of everything, the best of everything. And everyone gets inspired by that and then goes, okay, well, how can I do this at a level where smaller SMBs can actually start yeah. utilizing this to create maybe not exactly the same experience, but something very close to it. And for the value, the yeah. major impression is still there. Exactly. And there's another side to it as well, you know, getting into the technology. And I think this would be a, a scenario that would impact even Signage Live, as an mm. example, is you, know, you have a company and they want to do a big experience wall, but they have other digital signage on the same premise. And so that other digital signage is much more traditional standard digital signage. They're going to use a regular CMS. They're going to use regular yep. media players. And then they get to this one grand wall and they can't, you can't do yep. the regular media player. You can't use your CMS there. We have to use specialty software like touch designer. And now mm -hmm. to be able to change that and say, wait a second, you know, if we tone a couple things down, right? We know that we don't have the performance horsepower here, but if we tone a couple things down, you can run this grand LED wall with the same technology that's running the rest of your digital signage on premise. Mm. And that's a big factor for this because oftentimes you have this one special screen that has a special setup and it's no fun for anybody, it, especially when you're dealing with IT companies. And now this whole new software has to be blessed by <laughs> You know, we have to go through all of that over again because we have this one screen where they wanted it to be more unique and different. So if we can yeah. say, okay, oh, this grand LED screen that is immersive, that has cameras connected to it, that mm -hmm. can run in signage live on a right side player, right? I think and that, yeah, big, and that's been a compelling factor for me in challenging myself and some of the developers that I work with, we've got to deliver something. We've got to come up with something that is going to work in this space. I think that's really interesting because that is something that I'd never really considered uh, until you just mentioned it. But it is that's actually the crux of some of the issues that we challenges that we come across a lot, which is someone will come to you say, I have 90 digital signage screens that work just like my CMSs. Can you find a way for me to avoid going through my IT infrastructure security hoops to make sure I don't have to buy another piece of software, to make sure I don't have to buy a completely different piece of hardware, which involves new training, new hardware, new protocols, new procedures, and all of this for one experience, or maybe a few experiences over the mm -hmm. larger blanket um, kind of enterprise solution that they have. So to be able to say, yeah, we can do that. We can, just, we can pull away some of the major factors that you need, but leave you with the core of what you actually required. And it suddenly becomes far more cost effective, still delivers 90% of the impact that it was going to, but then suddenly becomes a lot more manageable and the processing power and everything else reduces. That's super important and really vital and allows people to start experimenting a little bit with these immersive pieces. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and when I, you know, we talk about low budget, the low budget side is the fact that these are 
somewhat easier to create. And also mm. I'm building a library of them. So at least we have starters. Every client is unique and different. They all want something unique to them, but mm. at least we have some starters. We can show them something and say, okay, is this going in the right direction? But the low budget really is the fact that we're keeping this within the same technology as the rest of the build. Mm. And that is, that's where the budget, the budget magic starts to happen is we don't need a extra $20,000 GPU heavy PC and yeah. touch designer and some of Houdini and some of the subscriptions that come along with that. This is going to mm -hmm. run as an HTML layer on top of your existing software tools. Yeah. Clever and that's code. been, yeah. Yeah. With, with that, and actually you stumbled on something there as you were talking that I really want to drill into, because obviously you say your customers come and say, we want to do this. What is their main driver for wanting to do it? Is it that they've seen it somewhere else and go, they can kind of imagine their building having that? Is it that they're being asked by someone in the company, say, we need to deliver some more impact? Like, what's the actual driving reason? Oh, a lot of things. I, I know one of the driving reasons, at least that in some of the initial conversations I have is they saw something somewhere else that was cool and they want that too. Yeah. Um, and so that's one driving factor. But, you know, more and more as we, we talk to clients that are, that I, you know, as I talk to a client that is very focused around creating a sense of emotion or creating a sense of experience, and they want people to stop. They're, you know, I get a lot of situations where the hardware, the LED wall has been there for years, mm. right? They put it in an LED wall two, three years ago, and they've been running stock footage of spring, summer, the seasonal stock footage mm -hmm. or whatever else you would always see. And it's kind of boring and nobody looks at it. And the idea that if you connect a camera to this and the person's walking by it and they realize I changed that screen, <laughs> they'll stop. And yeah. so, oh, as opposed to something that was just background wallpaper, digital wallpaper and a very expensive background digital wallpaper at that, to turn mm -hmm. that into something a lot more straightforward, but then to reduce the complexity of, oh, well, you were already using this type of media player. Yeah, they have a brand new version that has a GPU in it, go buy that plug that in, same everything. Everyone knows already how to use it all. Then we'll put this mm. on top that'll um, entice people to actually pay attention or stop or at least feel something. Beyond that, a lot of those work now I'm getting into nightclubs where, you know, or, or Stephen like step in repeat walls or events, live events, where mm -hmm. the idea is just to give the audience one more little snippet of fun as they're walking mm -hmm. around the space, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's been a driver too. It's just, we want to have a little bit of fun with the space or we already have an LED wall. What can we do with it? Those types of things. And yeah, it's been, um, I've been challenged on projects so often now of how do we do this? And it's been out of necessity that a lot of the content that I've created recently has sort of come to light. Um, mm. it's how do we do this is, has been a big area, you know, and it's funny because a lot of the generative art and a lot of the immersive art and a lot of these big sort of things that we hear about where this artist has been accepted to show in the lobby of a huge museum or whatever else, mm. uh, a lot of that's pre-rendered, right? They're using supercomputers and doing all this insane levels of AI and coding to generate that art, but they're mm. rendering out a 30 second video loop. And we can't do that when there's a camera connected. It's not pre-rendered. It has to be rendered on the fly. And so you know, it just becomes um, a series of how do we fit this into this and make this work with this? And in the end, you end up with some unique looking content that is also being live generated, um, so, which is a big deal. I think that's, yes, that's really interesting. And to kind of summarize where we started and where we are. So we've got a list of clients, a list of individuals that say, oh, I've seen something really attractive and we really see a part of our business where we could utilize this to add value, to add texture, to add con to just add brand recognition, just add a nicer experience in total. And as they go through that and they realize that hey, they don't maybe want to spend $20,000, as you say, on some supercomputer that's got, you know, yep. all, all of the bells and whistles. How can we generate something that lives within our CMS, lives within our infrastructure, but has something tangible and then something that's more immersive and unlike what you were talking about there, which is basically incredibly well-rendered, predefined, heavy editing content that loops for 30 seconds by introducing something that's far less budget strong. You can basically just say, 
it's going to interact with you on a much more live, much more visceral level that just ends up feeling, you know, more natural. And I'm sure you've, if you ever experienced that walk past a digital signage screen or you suddenly you, you've interacted with it, even unknowingly, and it just starts moving or flowing with you, everyone takes a second look and just kind of, you know, they wave at it. They try and move their head in the right direction. They find out what's triggering it and they start to get kind of in, increasingly confused or kind of like intrigued as to what's going on. So that's kind of where we're at now. Um, yeah. With the last question then, because I think this has been a really nice logical conversation all the way up into the end. What's the end result? What do te people tend to come back to and say, you know, thanks, Jim, we loved it. We experienced this that either we weren't expecting or this is exactly what we were hoping for and we've had this feedback. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think one of the big drivers for a lot of the work I'm doing is just they want to be able to see, again, that stopping power, right? This mm. was a screen it's a brand new screen that's one thing they might already have some conceptions there but a lot of the work where i'm just taking over an existing led screen it wasn't stopping anybody this was background noise and so to mm. take that and change the purpose of that screen so that now it's a uh, live show point in the space is, is huge uh, and it's somewhat surprising especially with some of the integrators i work with when oh, i say oh we need a regular web camera <laughs> not a depth sensing, crazy sensor, whatever else, just a regular web camera and typically a regular sort of highest end, but regular digital signage media player. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's been sort of, sort of surprising that you don't have to have a um, very fancy digital camera, a uh, very fancy array of digital cameras, mm -hmm. one basic one. And all the processing is done live within the media player. And, you know, we're kind of saying I'm now focused on like 30 frames per second is good. Right. right. <laughs> and a lot of the times a lot of the work I'm doing, we have to get 60. We're, in some cases we have to get higher uh, mm. because the screen filled. And so we're dealing with 120 second, uh, 120 frames per second, that kind of thing. And mm. so for this, it's just. What can fit within this player and what can we do? And what can we do? It looks creative. It looks fun. It engages people and gets them to sort of approach the screen and interact with it in some way. More mm. now, I, a lot of the projects I've done are much more artistically driven. They're much more just creating an experience in the space or let's leave at least a little bit of a vision. But, you know, I've done some projects recently where what's being moved, we're changing out the waterfall and we're putting in logo, corporate logos and using this right. more like a heat wall that you can interact with, uh, yeah. wave or goes out of the way and that kind of thing. So there's that kind of thing as well, where you're just, how can I directly experience, you know, create an experience with this brand in such a way that isn't so over the top. We're just sort of waving our hands and the logo gets uh, distorted. Yeah. That kind of thing happening as well. That's, that's really interesting. I think it's been funny having these last couple of conversations all in a row, because the amount of time that. I think the industry as a whole talks about digital signage is the nuts and the bolts and the code and the device. Whereas yeah. the reality <laughs> is that most of the driving questions are pretty emotionally driven. They are, oh, you know, I'm really struggling to engage with my workforce or, oh, we don't really have anything that gives that wow factor and it's not very impressive right. and it's none of it's financial. None of it's like ROI driven. It's not like we need to deliver this. It's about leaving that impression which funnily enough has its own return just in less financially tangible ways. We, we had a conversation a few weeks ago where we were saying, well, if you go into a building as a new employee or someone going in for an interview and one of them has welcome messages of all the team members and nice fam kind of welcome information and a really cool art wall that you can interact with and you go sit down or you get given a coffee and the other one is kind of like a dry white wall with nothing, it <laughs> leaves an impression on yeah. where you'd rather spend your time because you are spending time in that environment. And it's all of these intangibles that seem to actually be making up the driving factors of decision making, which is kind of before, before the last five, six episodes would have shocked me beyond belief. But that really seems to be the driving factor. Yeah, it's always been a challenge, especially for people like me, is that every client wants something unique and different. And mm -hmm. uh, for a long while, I was doing a lot of template driven interactive where we would sort of try to get clients to reuse the same thing that we you know, had in our library for, let's say mm -hmm. like a wave or an interactive directory or something like that. And, you know, you always find that client who wants their own thing. They want every single client essentially is looking for a very unique experience for them. 
and unique content and they all have unique needs. And so mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of our industry is always trying to sort of push people into a box of these are the templates. Oh, you wanted a different color? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, my work has always been, you know, there is no box. Let's just figure it out and create exactly what you need for uh, your unique situation and your unique retail situation, employee communication situation, whatever it might be. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because we've, I've experienced the same thing as I've been with Signage Live for kind of closing in on eight years. There was a big push right when I started where we have to have this massive a asset library of stuff that everybody needs. We have to have, you know, <laughs> default everything because no one knows how to pick up a pen. That kind of mentality across yeah. the whole industry. There are major changes since then. I think content has become much more accessible, but it also has become much more of the talking point, rightfully so. But it does give us, from a CMS perspective, a little bit more freedom to go, do you know what, we'll give you clocks and weather, we'll give you some of the basic things that you may want to see. But the reality is the content conversation is a different part. We, you need yeah. to go and speak to someone about content. Depending on your size, I mean, if you're looking at 20 screens and you've got someone in-house who's relatively okay with using Canva or some tool, fine. You know, they, might not need, they might not be at that level. But when we start looking at things that genuinely have like a brand alignment or an immersion level or something that adds more, just adds more uniqueness, I think artists are becoming far more crucial at that stage to leave that imprint. Um, and it's really interesting to hear you say basically the same thing. And from a CMS perspective, it's great because that's really not where we need to spend our time. We need to spend our time on the delivery of the content. Um, exactly. So yeah. it's kind of a, it's Actually, a good... I, on the creative side, for me, what I need from these tools is um, it, that assurance that they're going to keep working, that they're going to keep right. displaying content in the way that I created them. And mm -hmm. one of the first things that I did with generative art was to build a generative art piece that I knew could run on previous generation bright time players mm -hmm. and a few other players as well, not just bright time, not just single them out. And that was because my experience with these media players is that they're rock solid. Once you get mm -hmm. content running on them, it's going to stay running forever. Yeah. And so that's another driving factor around a lot of the work that we do in this industry is that it needs to have a, a long shelf life. We're not just creating something and it's going to get changed in two months. And so that's always been what you know, I don't need a software system or hardware system to have built-in widgets as much as I need it to just work. <laughs> right. wow. No, a hundred percent. I really, yeah, yeah it's, it's really insightful to talk about it in that way, because I think it kind of has completely changed the way that I look at digital signage, just from every perspective, because I would say from these conversations that I had that a lot of them have been with, um, you know, with some people within the business that speak to customers, and I'd love to go and speak to some more customers directly. If anybody out here is listening, I would love to have you on. If you've got digital <laughs> signage, I want to hear from you. Um, but I've also had some conversations with the university hospitals and some other ones where they were the direct end user, and it's the same conversation. It's like we wanted to leave an impact. We wanted to give something back to our workforce or the location or something that adds that value. So that's, that's really, really insightful. Jim, in terms of my last question, I always like to ask that kind of additional yeah. question on there. I think this is very fitting for you specifically, so I'll make sure we cover this one, which is with AI generation being so at the forefront of people's minds at the moment, has that made content creation from your perspective easier, harder? Has it expanded it? Has it made it more complex? Are you playing with that at all to see what can be built? I mean, I've fully embraced the new kind of creative workflow that just dropped into our laps earlier this or uh, March, no, January, really. Um, so we're going back a year with these tools. Yeah, I've been fully, I've been using and embracing them uh, in every possible way. They are uh, a superpower tool. And I hope, from my hope is that no artists or anybody involved with creation of anything is looking mm. at these tools as a danger. I know that there are some artists who've had their work essentially, you know, essentially copy and I hope we get over some of those issues right now, but really it's allowing somebody like me to feel like I have sudden superpowers of being able to create more than I've ever I've been able to create or work faster or work more effectively, especially since a lot of the work that I do is code driven. And especially since mm. a lot of these tools are very good at giving you, you know, helping you with an answer of mm. something that you're struggling with on the code side. 100%. And so, yeah, I can't stress enough that 
if you aren't using these tools, that's on your, that's your fault. <laughs> Not, you know, <laughs> you should start using them tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. I think it's here to stay. We've got to utilize it in a in a sane way. And there are, I think, some pitfalls that we need to cover. But if you're not using it, you will be left behind. There is yeah. not much else you can say about it. Jim, yeah. thank you so much for joining us on this session. Where can people find you? Oh, uh, simple ju enough, just nista.co, so just on the website. And then I'm on all the socials, Jim Nista. So nista.co or socials at Jim Nista. Feel free to reach out. I'm on LinkedIn as well, of course. And I do a lot of uh, creative consulting, like just sort of answering questions for people. And I love doing that. And so a lot of times I don't actually engage with the client. We just talk through a couple of questions. I give them a couple of answers and that's it. Cool. I'm always happy to do that. Just sort of move people forward and, um, uh, you know, help them out with their, some of their situations, even if I'm not uh, brought into the project. Perfect. Jim, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Hopefully we'll have you on again for another episode in the future, but thank you so for much sure. for joining this time. Yeah. Have All a great right, rest of your day. Much. Thank you very much again for listening to this episode with Jim. We hope that that really gave you some interesting concepts that you can build with. Jim obviously is proficient at this and it's really interesting to watch how he can take something that would be incredibly costly uh, as a first draft and, and watch that kind of get iteratively more cost effective as it expands outwards. We're trying to create a community of individuals here that know about digital signage and build on that to help others engage with the format. If you've got any questions or if you'd like to speak to us, you can always reach out to us on LinkedIn, LinkedIn directly. You can follow me, Tim Baker, at LinkedIn and find our LinkedIn uh, article, which happens on a bi-weekly basis and catch up with the rest of our content there. You'll also find us on YouTube and, of course, at signagelive.com. We're trying to create this community again, as I said, and I really, really appreciate all of the support so far. So if you do want to follow along, do give us a like, a follow. And if you're listening to this on any audio service, then feel free to give it a rate and a star. It really helps us get found to the right people. And again, we'll see you on the next episode.